evening. I'm Arlene Sanders. Actually, it's 10.30 in the morning on May 19th, but we in the television business like to give you the impression that everything you watch is happening live. We just like to give you the impression that everything you watch is happening live. Some people in our industry call shows like this live on tape. That's doublespeak. It's not quite lying, but it's not telling the truth either. While doublespeak is often amusing, it has serious consequences in the hands of public officials. When members of the Reagan administration used the phrase revenue enhancement for tax increase and poorly buffered precipitation for acid rain, they clouded our understanding of important public issues and protected themselves with a Teflon shield of unaccountability. In his 1946 essay, Politics in the English Language, George Orwell wrote that when there is a gap between one's real and one's declared aims, one turns instinctively to long words and exhausted idioms. Orwell warned of the corruption of language by politics and politics by language. Today, over 40 years later, an English professor named William Lutz is picking up where Orwell left off. To the dismay of many politicians and corporate executives, Lutz is fighting a public battle against doublespeak. We begin our adventure in doublespeak in Lutz's teaching environment, um, that is, classroom, at Rutgers University in Camden, New Jersey. The um, Ayatollah Khomeini says that the reason he kills so many people, so that's just a perception that it's the mass murder of people. What they're really doing is purifying and getting rid of the uh, immoral elements. The problem is that you can let words become things. The word becomes the reality. It's not bombing. It's air support. It's not the slaughter of thousands. It's the elimination of unreliable elements. What is it? It's not murder. It's termination with extreme prejudice. You see, if you let the word take the place of the thing, then you've moved away from reality. And then by manipulating words, you manipulate reality. William Lutz has a passion for words, a passion that sometimes turns into laughter, sometimes into outrage when he hears words abused by public officials. I only know that that's why I have said repeatedly that I want to find out, I want to get to the bottom of this and find out all that has happened. And so far, I've told you all that I know, and you know the truth of the matter is, for quite some long time, all that you knew is what I told you. What did he say? <laughs> Lutz collects examples of doublespeak in government, business, and everyday life. He reports the latest verbal atrocities in the quarterly review of doublespeak, a newsletter which he publishes with the support of the National Council of Teachers of English. I get thousands of letters. At first it was just a few, then hundreds, now thousands. Here's a letter from Virginia, where the writer tells me that while he was in the late Navy, his job assignment was to energize and de-energize a superheterodyne receiver. When he asked what that meant, they said, turn the radio on and off. Lutz's inspiration is George Orwell. In the novel 1984, Orwell invented Newspeak, a language designed to restrict thought and thereby help the state maintain its iron grip on the people. At the core of Newspeak, was the mental process which Orwell called doublethink. To use logic against logic, to repudiate morality while laying claim to it. Even to understand the word doublethink involved the use of doublethink. Remember the, uh, the three slogans in the world of 1984, the contradictory slogans, what were they? Um, war is peace. War is peace. Ignorance is strength. Mm -hmm. And Slavery is freedom, and we say, you know, how absurd, right? No, this is absolutely absurd. Nobody, those are contradictory ideas. But to believe in both of those is to believe, practice doublethink, right? We don't do that, right? What is the function of the Department of Defense, for example? War. Yeah, it's the Department of War. So what are we spending $300 billion a year on? Peace. Not war? What are all those guns for? What are all those tanks for? What are all those missiles for? To maintain peace. To maintain peace? How do they maintain peace? By threatening war. By threatening war. By not killing people? We make guns to not kill people, right? We have the threat that we can give to other people to maintain our peace. Okay, so peace is the threat of war. All right, yes. 
Is that what you mean by peace? Is that what we mean by, if you're Christian and you believe that Christ is the king of peace? Christ is the king of the threat of war. Loses something in the translation there, doesn't it? Lot says that since his students came of age in the heyday of doublespeak, they never developed a sense of indignation at the abuse of language. Words are important because they express our thoughts. They free us from our prison of ourselves. We use words to say to people, I love you, I need you, I'm alone, I'm happy, I'm sad. All we have are words. So too we only have words for freedom and democracy and liberty and justice and all those values, those abstract things that are so important to us. If we think that it's just words, mere rhetoric, empty words, are we really saying that these are empty values, mere values? These aren't important? Communication isn't important? Words are how we reach out. Words are how we shape the world. world. Words are how we touch each other. If we don't have respect for words, if we don't guard and protect words and let others take them away from us, they're taking away the world from us, which is exactly what happened in 1984. Joining us now as our guide to doublespeak is William Lutz. I guess what we should do first is define doublespeak. Uh, what exactly is it? Is it just a kind of euphemism? Uh, well, there's at least four kinds of doublespeak. The first kind is a euphemism, but a euphemism used to mislead. The U.S. Army now doesn't say killing the enemy, it's servicing the target. Uh, a second kind is, is jargon, you know, the specialized language doctors, lawyers use. The airplane didn't crash, it was an involuntary conversion of a 727. <laughs> uh, a third kind is just what we call bureaucraties, gobbledygook, lots of words piled on top of everything so that you say, what did he say, what did he say? And the fourth kind is inflated language, trying to puff up things, make it seem important. Um, hexaform rotatable surface compression unit. That's $2,028 uh, that you would pay for a steel nut if you're the Pentagon. Is it different from just plain lying? Yes, because it stops short of lying. Doublespeak, in a sense, is lying to yourself. That is, you're, you are saying one thing and believing another at the same time. You, you stand there and say, well, it's not a tax increase, it's only revenue enhancement. One of the uh, other things you're involved in is uh, you're in charge of an annual doublespeak award, which is given by the National Council of Teachers of English. What's that all about? We started giving the award in 1974. It's, it's symbolic, and it's an ironic award to the person or organization that, in our judgment, has perpetrated the most outrageous use of doublespeak. In 1974, the first award went to a U.S. Air Force colonel for saying to the American press corps in Cambodia, you always write it's bombing, bombing, bombing. It's not bombing, it's air support. Of course it was bombing. Of course it was, it was bombing, lots of bombing. And in uh, 19 <laughs> 1986, we gave the award for the language used uh, about the Challenger uh, accident. And in 1987, we gave the award to Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North and Admiral John Poindexter. Hmm. Plenty of candidates. We have uh, a clip of Oliver North at those hearings, uh, the Iran-Contra hearings. And uh, by way of background, this is when Congressional Attorney John Neils was trying to pin North down about his role in uh, constructing a false chronology of events to mislead Congress. So let's watch the clip, and uh, then you can give us your comments. I was provided with additional input that was radically different from the truth. I assisted in furthering that version. Who gave you that input? It is my recollection it was provided by Mr. McFarlane. Are you telling the committee that he told you a different version of the facts, or are you telling us that he told you to write down a different version of the facts? I was provided with a different version of the facts. They were, I believe, transmitted to me in a, in a note, a, a prof's note, or a uh, actual written uh, memorandum that is basically what's here that is inconsistent with what I knew to be the truth. 